Hello my friends and welcome to Fish Street. I'm Alexander Williamson and today we're going to be talking about one of the most controversial topics I've encountered in freshwater fish keeping and that is nitrates. What is a safe level of nitrates, specifically in a planted aquarium versus also in an aquarium where maybe you don't have plants, maybe it's a biotope, maybe it's a harder water aquarium, or maybe it's a situation where you're spawning fish. What is a safe level or limit and how high should we allow our nitrates to go before we need to worry about doing a water change or adding something to uh, bond with those nitrates and make it safe for our fish? Now, fish and shrimp, invertebrates, snails, they're all going to have different thresholds. Saltwater fish have a much higher threshold for nitrates before they become poisonous, and we know that there is a level at which nitrates become poisonous. However, throughout history, scientists had been split on whether nitrates were really a problem or a potential poison in a natural ecosystem. And the reason behind this is actually pretty fascinating and it has to do with a invention that occurred around the turn of the century in which we figured out how to use the nitrogen that exists in the atmosphere at 70% of our atmosphere. We think of it as being oxygen that we breathe, but it's 70% nitrogen. Only organic forms of that nitrogen are not usable from what's in our atmosphere. So this has to be converted into other forms like ammonia, nitrites, nitrates, different ions and compounds in which plants, fungus, bacteria, and animals can then use it. And then it is a crucial component in growth and just basic functions of biology in just about every organism and every system on anything from bacteria all the way to the most complex organisms like humans. So why is there such a split on whether it's dangerous or whether it's safe and why was it not clear until very recently among scientists that in fact nitrates are a toxin they are poisonous and that they are poisonous at a lower threshold than historically we've admitted well thanks to a paper that was recently published last year that looked at every paper on studying ammonia, nitrates, nitrites, and ecology of freshwater fish, saltwater fish, invertebrates, mammals, you name it. They did a survey of all of the toxicity of nitrogen compounds, and then they wanted to establish what safe limits are for our aquariums, but really what they're looking at is what is a safe limit for nitrogen for humans, which we've had established since the 1980s officially by the United States EPA, but we've also wanted to have a level for fish because obviously we're not the same as fish after all. And in aquaculture where they grow fish for food, this is becoming an ever more important source of protein for people all around the world and there need to be guidelines for what is a safe environment and a productive environment in which we farm these fish and oftentimes we can then take that information and because nobody's forking out millions of dollars to do research on what a safe aquarium nitrate level is we can assume that the levels that they put out for fish that are being raised to be eaten by humans to be healthy to be bred on farms that that level is probably somewhere in the range of what we should also be thinking about for our aquariums and that is the logic i'm proceeding on in this video but first let's talk talk a little bit about the nitrogen cycle and the different toxicities of that cycle and why it is that nitrate is the least toxic and least poisonous form of nitrogen compounds that end up in our aquarium and why many people think that they're not an issue because if you have 200 parts per million you're not going to see a fish die from that but up in the eight nine hundred parts per million we start to see some species actually dying from toxicity of nitrates in the aquarium or in the wild. However, historically, nitrates really never got that high in natural ecology until this invention by a German at the turn of the 20th century. All of this goes into why we think what we think today 
and let's cover it all and let's talk about these numbers and amounts and what the newest science says. So around the turn of the 20th century, just before, scientists around the world were trying to figure out how to pull all that nitrogen out of our atmosphere like bacteria does, like we now know bacteria does, and turn it into the energy that we knew it needed to be for plants. And we figured it out. A man by the name of Fritz Haber, who he is an incredible guy that you should learn about all on his own right. He won the Nobel Peace Prize for figuring out how to make ammonium nitrate, how to take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it into our soil, unlocking the potential to grow more food than had ever been grown before. 30 times more food can be grown than would normally be possible in nature. And he figured this out and literally the world's population spiked and exploded in the 20th century. The same guy, however, was a crazy fanatic and a German government lackey who is responsible for some of the worst war crimes and inventions of chemical warfare uh, that have ever occurred in human history. Okay, so back to the point, though, that now it's the 20th century and we have the Haber-Bosch process. They won a Nobel Prize and they are figuring out how to pump out lots of nitrogen in usable forms. And we start to notice in nature that the nitrates that used to always kind of be the end result of the process naturally were actually building up in their own right. So whereas nature would have an algae bloom and then a couple weeks later it would take care of itself or some plants would use it up or it would wash away and be diluted, now we were seeing lakes and rivers near agricultural places like farms where suddenly there were rivers where all the fish were dying and algae and bacteria, cyanobacteria, had totally taken over. And it began to cause people to look again at nitrates on their own and see is it possible that they are one of the poisons or one of the problems going on and it seemed for a long time like the fact that you could have nitrates at a level of two three four maybe even 500 parts per million in an aquarium put a fish in there and it would survive that seemed to prove that it wasn't that big of a thing to worry about. And in most aquariums, you're probably not going to get levels higher than that ever, even if you never did a water change, because bacteria and other things would start to grow, algae would start to grow, and something would take care of it. Well, the problem is that that was the amount that we were looking for in order to just straight up kill a fish. And it turns out that obviously some things exist out there that can be worse than death, like disease. And it turns out that we saw in the 20th century when we unlocked the power of nitrates, uh, we also realized the explosive power of the nitrogen and the energy it unleashes, but we also saw the industrial application and we saw that people being exposed to large amounts of it were actually no longer able to hold on to oxygen in their blood and instead nitrogen would bond with the red blood cells with the hemoglobin and they would get what we call brown blood and fish can still get this when their nitrates get too high and this is what we call nitrate poisoning generally in the hobby now it may not be that common to see but that is the acute occurrence and it can occur at some levels around three or four hundred parts per million in some sensitive fish species such as uh, trout or salmon but we don't keep those fish and a lot of the fish that we do keep in the aquariums also are able to breathe air from the top of the aquarium like labyrinth fish or they're able to take in gulps of air like catfish and so they're able to kind of get around sometimes the uh the impact of having a polluted water source. Now that's not all fish, but it is quite a few of the early fish in the hobby that were hardy and easily kept. So yet again, we didn't see a whole lot of fish dying that we could directly say, okay, that is nitrates uh, that is going to uh, cause the death of that fish. But as we look with time passing, we saw in humans and mammals that not just acute poisoning, but long-term health consequences were occurring. Things like liver and kidney failure, hormonal irregulation, um, brain lesions, and all sorts of other issues were going on. And 
when we went back and looked at it, we realized that at a high level, but probably higher than nature would allow to occur, that fish will face the same consequences. Same with lab rats as well. And now that we use fertilizers in our aquarium, or we use things like substrates that have nitrogen and nitrates already in them to enrich them and feed our plants, now we're entering an age of keeping fish in aquaria where we're artificially inflating how much nitrate, nitrite, ammonia, how much of all that there is, as well as all the other macro and micronutrients in the aquarium. And so it's been worth asking, well, at what level is it causing health problems where our fish don't want to spawn, for instance? So back to feeding the planet. Well, now we are needing to source protein like never before, and the oceans are becoming depleted or harder and harder to fish for uh, enough food right offshore. And so people are turning to inland freshwater farms and farming fish. And in this case, there needs to be parameters set up by the community, by scientists and aquaculturists that are informing of what a healthy habitat is like. And it turns out that, yes, your fish may not die, but it's also not going to spawn. It's not going to be active. So it may be lethargic because it doesn't have enough oxygen in its blood. It may uh, die much earlier because it has kidney troubles. So there are other consequences that play out even if it is not the acute toxicity. So now we know, thanks to this giant paper that was done in 2023, that the limits set for humans at between 40 and 50 parts per million are actually a pretty good limit for fish as well. We're seeing that that limit scales pretty well and that freshwater fish, while some are sensitive to as little as 10 parts per million, of the nitrites and nitrates when they are young and we knew the nitrites would be a problem but the nitrates being an acute problem was unexpected and in recent research since 2018 they've seen several fish species where the larvae or the eggs or newly hatched fish are actually dying off from acute toxicity at very low levels of nitrates. And so now we are at the turning point where we have started to study each species and when they'll spawn, if they'll spawn and act like they do in nature or if they won't. And because the aquarium hobby does not have uh, the funding of institutions that want to spend millions or billions of dollars researching these things, nobody's really put out a good guideline. And while the EPA did the guideline of 50 parts per million for humans in 1986, in 1987 uh, that said that would avoid any acute poisonings. Uh, it turns out that that also is true for fish now we know and that levels above that, sure your fish may survive and maybe that's okay, that you just want your fish to survive. But if you want them to thrive, if you want them to have babies, you want them to reproduce, you want them to look good and be colorful, you need to keep the nitrates down to a level that's not toxic. They've realized now by looking at their tissue under microscopes that even at levels of 40 or 50 parts per million, there's still tissue in a lot of species that is seeing long-term damage from the nitrates. And so they're really rethinking what level is safe. And they had to pick an arbitrary level to some degree because that's just what they're going to say is safe for farming the fish that we need to feed the world with more and more. But also, you know, you need to grow those fish and they need to be healthy and happy enough to reproduce. So we set it at a limit lower than the acute toxicity, but high enough that it allowed some wiggle room. And this is the suggestion of sorts for the aquarium hobby or for aquaculture in this article that came out and that studied all sorts of things like, you know, the specific uh, toxicity to a carp or to a goldfish or to a betta. And also, specifically, they studied some of those animals that are kind of seen as lab rats, but really what they looked at was food fish, so tilapia, catfish, things like this, um, 
freshwater prawns and things that are being grown on farms because that's where the big money and investments are uh and so, therefore, that's where the the studies are coming from, not for a lack of need, but just for a lack of resources and finances. Nobody's funding this work to be officially done for the aquarium side of things, unless it's going to make them money as a food stock or some sort of resource. In any case, I hope you can see now that nitrates can be pretty dangerous to your aquarium and that we should probably keep them down below 40 or 50 parts per million for our fish, uh, according to this giant survey and study. Uh, I'd like to hear what your opinions are if you've noticed that, yeah, my fish survive, but they're not spawning, or if they are spawning in high nitrate water. I'd like to hear about that too. So let me know in the comments what you think. And thank you again for joining me on this somewhat of a deep dive into nitrates. All right, guys, take care. And I will talk to you next time on Fishery.